John Bartlin, Master Potter, America's First Porcelain. Staffordshire in Camden. We can thank Dr. George Terry, ceramic expert Bradford Rauschenberg, and archaeologist Stanley South for rediscovering John Bartlin, a master potter from Staffordshire, England, and the important work he brought to South Carolina in the 18th century. George Terry discovered the Cane Hoy site where Bartlin worked. Bradford Rauschenberg, director of research at MESDA, or the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts, researched Bartlin from the 1970s into the 1990s. Stanley South's textbooks established archaeology as a scientific process in the late 1970s, and he worked on very important excavations in South and North Carolina, including Charlestown Landing, Santa Elena, and Bethabara. His work at Cane Hoy became a passion which spanned the years from 1990 until his death in March 2016. At Cane Hoy, South and his colleagues were investigating the site associated with Bartlin, who came to South Carolina in 1763 and opened a pottery factory near Charleston. South reported on his findings and studies in the 2004 publication, John Bartlin, Staffordshire in South Carolina. Creamware and glazedware ceramics were a popular export to the American colonies in the 18th century, as the colonists did not have a local source for fine ceramic wares at that time. John Bartlam saw an opportunity to capitalize on that market by coming to South Carolina and establishing a pottery works. At Cane Hoy, Bartlam's first pottery, South and his colleagues found sherds that showed the breadth of Bartlam's production. The array of what he was producing in America is stunning. Bartlam produced excellent examples of the creamware and glazed wares so prevalent in the British market. He had the well-known English ceramics maker Josiah Wedgwood alarmed to the point that Wedgwood wrote propaganda denouncing Bartlam's works in South Carolina. It is very appropriate that Camden celebrates Bartlam's work. After leaving Cane Hoy, Bartlam established and ran a pottery in Camden from 1772 until 1781 when he died. So, Staffordshire in Camden. John Bartlam, Master Potter. John Bartlam was born in England about 1735 or 1736. Around the time he was 15 years old, he began training to become a potter. This would have been an appropriate vocation for him as, in 1758, Bartlam reported that he was from Stoke-on-Trent Parish in Staffordshire, the center of the pottery producing industry in England. Stoke-on-Trent is the largest city in Staffordshire and is known today for the pottery productions of Wedgwood, Spode, and Royal Dalton, all familiar names for us. In Bartlam's day, Stoke-on-Trent was the center of the master ceramics world in Great Britain, and there he would have had many masters from which to learn the trade. We do not know who he worked under, but in 1769 he declared that he had been working as a potter for 18 years. Bartlam married Mary Allen in 1754 in a little village three miles from Stoke-on-Trent. They had a daughter, Honor, in 1761, and two years later had daughter Betty Allen. Just after Betty Allen's birth, John Bartlam left England for South Carolina to set up trade as a potter in Charleston. It is not clear that his wife and daughters accompanied him on his first voyage, but at some point they joined him in South Carolina. John Bartlam was not a man of letters. We have found no correspondence from him or to him. His story is told by the actions he took here in America. There is no doubt that he came to America to make money. Imported Staffordshire pottery was in high demand in the colonies. No one was producing anything of that quality here in America. Colonial potters made serviceable vessels of stoneware and glazedware. Fine quality tablewares were all imported from England, Spain, Portugal, or France. In America, Bartlam would have the corner on high-end, domestically made ceramic wares. By choosing to come to Charleston, he placed himself in the most prosperous city in British North America at that time, a ready market for what he produced. Bartlam in Camden 
John Bartlam moved his pot works to Camden sometime in the summer of 1772. In July, he paid Joseph Kershaw five pounds, ten shillings, presumably for something from Kershaw's store. On October 19, 1772, an article ran in the South Carolina and American General Gazette stating that John Bartlam was in the custody of the sheriff at Camden for non-payment of debts to Charleston creditors, who were instructed to report to the courthouse for a trial of Bartlam. How that resolved is not known, but Bartlam was either set free or paid the debt, for he continued living in Camden. The Bartlams apparently lived a very comfortable life in Camden. They owned a house and lot with outbuildings, a garden, and fence land not far from Joseph Kershaw's house. In addition, they owned three other town lots adjacent to their home. These were very large town lots, spanning the distance between Fair and Mill Streets at the eastern end of King Street. They raised ten head of cattle on their land. John had a horse for transportation. They also owned one slave, a young African-American male. In 1763, when Bartlam came to America, the issues of American freedoms were already a topic of debate. Bartlam clearly considered himself an Englishman, as did other residents of the American colonies, but he did not believe in American independence from the mother country. Nevertheless, when the American Revolutionary War started in 1775, Bartlam initially joined the state militia. The psychology behind Bartlam's entering the state militia service probably had much to do with his loyalty to Joseph Kershaw and his business dealings in Camden where the great majority were staunch patriots. But apparently, when the patriots lost at the Battle of Camden in 1780, and Camden was subsequently occupied by the British, his allegiance shifted to the most viable means of survival for him and his business. This may have cost him his life. In May 1781, five loyalist turncoats were hung in Camden after the Battle of Hobkirk's Hill. Although we do not know the names of these men, we do know that Bartlam died before July 10, 1781, as witnessed by his wife Mary when being declared his executrix in Charleston. We also know that, in 1783, the state declared Bartlam a deceased loyalist deserter from a South Carolina militia company on a list of royalists whose estates would be confiscated. We may never know the exact story of Bartlam's death, but one thing is sure. Bartlam joined a South Carolina militia from Camden and was later discovered fighting on the British side before he died in 1781. Mary Bartlam and her daughters, and John if he was still alive, evacuated Camden with the British under Lord Rawdon on May 10, 1781. Years later, Mary explained why they were forced to leave Camden with the British. She said, the people in my old district are very cold to me on account of the part my late husband and myself took in the war. The Loyalist refugees with Rawdon were settled outside the walls of Charleston at a place called Rawdon Town near the present-day Charleston Airport. There the refugees lived and died in the squalor of poorly made shacks and disarray. Mary was described as a distressed refugee in Charleston by August 10, 1781. By September 1783, Mary had fled to St. Augustine in British East Florida. There, in an effort to gain compensation from the British government, she declared the 525 pounds worth of possessions the family had lost in Camden. By 1788, Mary and her daughters had moved back to Charleston, where she had to work to support her family. There, she still sought compensation from the British consul, who wrote, the poor woman is in great distress, and deserved, in my opinion, some assistance from the British government. Mary and her daughters eventually returned to England. She died in Staffordshire in 1818. Bartlam's Pottery in Camden The exact site of Bartlam's pottery factory in Camden has long been a mystery. The archaeologist who excavated at historic Camden during the 1970s did not find a location there for Bartlam's kiln. They did, however, find sherds of his pottery at the Kershaw House site and in other test sites. 
They surface tested the Bartlett owned town lots for kiln activity and found nothing to indicate a kiln was ever located there. After researching this exhibit, we believe that the pottery factory and kiln was located in the vicinity of the northwestern corner of the 1798 bounds of Camden. An account by a Charleston visitor, a Dr. Clitheroe, written in 1776, described his journey to the kiln site. If you follow his route, you will come to the northern end of Wiley Street. Today, this area has a mineral known as kaolin, a necessary component for fine ceramics, both on the surface of the ground and barely below the soil level. This is not a natural occurrence. Kaolin is naturally found in the fourth level of soil strata, in the subsoil. It has to be dug out of the earth, sometimes from a great depth in the soil. Here, the kaolin is two inches below the top layer of soil, or the organic layer of decomposed leaves and plants called the humus. Also near this site is a ditch containing waters of the diverted Belton's branch where wet kaolin clay has been found on the surface of the ground. Another clue to the location of the kiln and factory is the location of the borrow pit. A pottery factory the size of Bartlam's would have to have access to large amounts of clay. Digging clay or soil leaves an excavated area known as the borrow pit. Near the northwestern corner of Camden are two springs which form the head of a creek once called Harold's Branch. By the end of the 18th century, it had been renamed Belton's Branch because it ran through John Belton's property below the spring heads. The soil beneath the springs is kaolinitic, and kaolin clay can be found on the surface of the ground where the diverted waters of Belton's Branch flow in this area. Obviously, the Marshy Springs area was excavated over time, likely by clay or kaolin mining. At some time prior to 1796, it was deep enough to hold water. In that year, James Kershaw recorded in his journal, quote, fishing party at Belton Springs. As recently as 1938, the area contained a pond, as indicated on a South Carolina state highway map. This was very likely John Bartlam's borrow pit, as it is the only possible location for a borrow pit in the vicinity of town. It also happens to be very near to the suspected kiln and factory site. The visitor's description, the concentrations of kaolin, and the location of the borrow pit all lead us to speculate that this must be the vicinity of the kiln and factory site. Unfortunately, this site has been heavily disturbed over time. The Seaboard Airline Railroad, constructed in 1899, runs adjacent to the site along an eight-foot embanked rail line, and a spur of the railroad runs along the eastern boundary of the site on another embankment. A cement plant was built on the site and operated there for many years. At present, the site is a construction yard for a local company. Wiley Street, between Lawrence Street and the railroad, has become a residential development, and land to the east of the site, where kaolin clay was also found on the surface, has been developed for residences. We may never know for sure exactly where the kiln and factory were located. Kilns John Bartland came from a Staffordshire, England tradition of bottle kilns, massive, multiple-storied brick kilns. It would have been possible for him to have built a bottle-type kiln here for South Carolinians were making bricks early in our history. To operate a pottery factory, Bartland's kiln would have to be large enough to accommodate quantities of vessels. There are few documented historic kilns in South Carolina. The ones used in the Edgefield pottery community were groundhog kilns. The Seagrove potters in North Carolina, near the South Carolina line, also historically used groundhog kilns. One old kiln seen at Old Salem in North Carolina is an above-ground rectangular kiln constructed of brick. The basic requirements for a kiln is a firebox to provide the constant high heat, a firing chamber where the pottery is placed, and a chimney or flue to allow smoke to exit the kiln. The most easily constructed kiln would have been a groundhog kiln. One could be constructed by one or two men with no special materials other than brick and some framing wood. Normally, they are built up a slight hill. 
which are common in the northwestern area of Camden, where Dr. Clitheroe's directions lead us. China Clay the settlement period of South Carolina in the 18th century coincided with the English pottery maker's search for the secret method of porcelain production. Porcelain is a refined type of pottery which requires special clay and is fired at a hotter temperature. Porcelain is delicate, impervious to water, translucent, and very desirable. At this time, the porcelain market traded in wares made in China and India. The British wanted a corner of this thriving trade which supplied the upper classes of Britain and America with fine china. The ideal soil for pottery making contains kaolin. Kaolin is a soft white mineral which turns to a fine clay when wet. The clays found in South Carolina are of many different colors, reddish, brown, gray, and beige. The most desirable of all is the pure white china clay or as historically known in South Carolina, Cherokee clay. It was thought that this white South Carolina clay would be the magic material for making porcelain. Potters were right about the white clay. After years of searching, it was discovered that the Cherokee Indians had secret stores of it in the mountains of their northern South Carolina territory. They were not eager to give it up to the colonial settlers, but they allowed some shipments to be taken down to Charleston and sent to England for trials. However, the quantities needed by the English pottery factories were never located in South Carolina. By 1768, the British chemist, William Cookworthy, discovered both the materials and the process to make hard paste porcelain in his factory at Plymouth, England. His was the only British factory making the true or hard paste porcelain, while other English potters were producing soft paste porcelain. While British demand for the American clay dried up as a result of this discovery, American potters John Bartlam in South Carolina and Bonin and Morris in Pennsylvania were still searching for the ideal American clay. John Bartlam found that clay in Camden. The Norfolk sandy loam and the Marlborough sandy loam soil types underlying nearly the entire area occupied by the town. Both of these soil types are kaolinitic, which meant that Camden had the ideal soil type to support a pottery making industry. Prone Ceramics and Molded Ceramics John Bartland made as many as 38 different patterns of ceramics. These ceramics fall into two major types, those thrown on a potter's wheel and shaped by hand, and those formed using molds. For instance, the mocha ware and yellow glazed ware in this exhibit were shaped on a potter's wheel by hand. Each piece of thrown earthenware varies slightly according to the maker. The cauliflower ware and pineapple ware were cast in molds, giving them a very detailed, consistent design which is only varied through the application of colored glazes. Bartlam owned ceramic molds just like those used by Staffordshire potters in England. This allowed his factory to produce fashionable wares just like those produced in Staffordshire, which could sell in America without the added cost of shipping them across the Atlantic Ocean. There is a very good example of thrown ceramics in the exhibit in the Bradley House at Historic Camden. This little yellow ware bowl has been attributed to John Bartlam's pottery works here in Camden. John Bartlam's Porcelain John Bartlam's work was notable in his day. David Ramsey wrote of his work in Camden in his 1808 History of South Carolina. A pottery was also erected by an Englishman of the name of Bartlam. Various handicraft men found profitable employment and Camden continued to thrive till it was checked by the war. However, it was not until Stanley South and Brad Rauschenberg began their years-long research on Bartlam in the 20th century that we understood how really important his work was. Bartlam himself probably did not understand the significance of his blue and white soft paste porcelain dishes. It was only after a scientist performed a chemical analysis of the blue and white china in 2007 that everyone involved in the Kane Hoy study realized exactly what Bartlam had accomplished. He was indeed the first potter in America to discover the process of making porcelain. John Bartlam, Master Potter, 
America's first porcelain.